No mai, haere mai, kia ora tato. Happy Mother's Day and welcome to the second episode of the Auckland Writers' Festival Winter Series. I am your host, Paula Morris, speaking to you from my living room in Auckland. Thanks to our very generous partner, Auckland Live, for their technical support in helping make this series possible and show me how I can sit further away from the screen. <laughs> now, once again, this is how our episode will work. We'll welcome all three writers. I'll chat with them in turn about their latest book and they'll each do a short reading. You too can ask questions throughout using the chat functions on Facebook and YouTube. I will be checking for questions and will try to ask them uh, time permitting after each reading. Towards the end of our hour today, all three writers will return for a final question or two. Now, please share this episode via social media and remember, it is free to view. This entire series is free to view. So ignore any requests for credit cards. And with any live streaming event, there's a risk of spammers. So please do not click on any links in the comments unless those links are supplied by the Auckland Writers' Festival. And one final reminder, the writers' books we're discussing today are available for sale or order. Just click on the buy the book link in the episode description. Now, please join me in welcoming from London, Philippe Sands. Wonderful to be with you, wonderful to be in New Zealand. Kia ora, Philippe. Ian Weddy in Wellington, no, Auckland, sorry. Morena, hello everybody. Ian's very close to me, so it's ridiculous I get confused about where he is. And please welcome Lisa Tadeo in Connecticut. Hi, how are you? So nice to meet you. Thank you all very much. Kia ora, thanks for joining us this morning, or whatever time it is with you around the world. And Lisa and uh, Ian will be talking to you very soon, so no going back to bed, please. Now, our first conversation this morning is with Philippe Sands, writer, commentator, barrister, and professor of law. He's the author of numerous books on international law and the memoir East West Street. His latest book is The Rat Line, Love, Lies, and Justice on the Trail of a Nazi Fugitive. A bestseller in the UK a week after its publication, it's a gripping account of an Austrian war criminal, Otto von Wechter, who went on the run in 1945, abetted by his wife, Charlotte. Kia ora, Philippe. Uh, the Rat Line has been called a non-fiction thriller, and I have to say I found it an absolute page turner, particularly when the tentacles reach into the Vatican. I hadn't heard of Otto von Wechter, who held very key roles in Poland and Ukraine, and among other things, established the Jewish ghetto in Krakow. Not a monster, you contend. I, I'm very careful how I for characterize people. He did monstrous things. He was indicted for mass murder, but he was also a father, a lover, a parent, a friend, a lawyer, and many other things. And I think what I've come to understand, perhaps in my other job in courtrooms, is that life is nuanced and complex. And in many ways, perhaps the book is actually a love story. It's a story about the relationship between Otto and Charlotte, his wife, uh, and I'm able to write it because their son, one of their six children, Horst, gave me the entire family archive, 20 years of letters, diaries, cassette recordings, 10,000 pages, which took me a long time to trawl through. But you've got a real sense of life at the top table with a Nazi couple. Now, talking about his son, Horst, uh, you dedicate this book to fathers and sons. And as you say, Horst was too young, really, to remember his father but he becomes your fellow traveler in this journey. And he is and remains an apologist for his parents and saw Otto as a man of honor, despite the evidence. Did you ever think you could change his mind? It's complicated. I mean, I met uh, Horst 10 years ago. Uh, we've taken a long journey. We've done uh, newspaper profiles together. We made a movie together for the BBC. We've done a podcast and now there's this book. And at each stage, his position has been very clear. He, he's not a Nazi and he's not an apologist for Nazism. He accepts that terrible things happen and he accepts that his father was implicated in those terrible things. But what he refuses to do is accept that his father is a criminal. He, his view is his father was indicted, was never caught and therefore never tried and never convicted. But I think the true story, uh, occasionally Horst will say to me, you know, the reality is I don't love my father, I love my mother. And I think the heart of this story is a boy's love for his mother. Charlotte loved Otto in uh, rather peculiar ways, one may say it uh, in a certain sense, 
but it's the love, it's the son's love of the father that I think is transferred, uh, the son's love of the mother that is transferred into, towards the father. And in the book, you talk about a power shift in a way from Otto to Charlotte, the moment he went on the run. And you just said now that she loved him in peculiar ways. Would you expand on that? Well, they meet in 1929. Uh, they're both rabid anti-Semites. They're both paid up supporters of the National Socialist Party, true believers. Uh, they marry in 32. He has to flee Austria in 34 because he's involved in the killing of Dolphus. And in 38, the Anschluss, they stand together with Adolf Hitler on the balcony of the Hofburg overlooking the Heldenplatz. And she describes that. She's a smart person. She writes well, uh, very graphically. And she is absolutely with him as he becomes governor of Krakow and then governor of Galicia. And of course, it's very personal to me in a certain sense, because my grandfather is from the city of Lemberg, where Otto Wechter was based. Uh, and he, Wechter, was responsible for the extermination of my grandfather's entire family. So it's a complicated story. But then in 1945, he escapes. He disappears off the face of the earth. Uh, and the second part of the book tells that story. But what is remarkable is that in that moment, there is a total power shift between the couple. She, if you like, has a relationship of dependence on him for most of the first 15 years of their life together. But the last five years, he is utterly dependent on her and there is a complete transformation. And that for me uh, was fascinating. I mean, uh, Charlotte did not die until the 80s. And 85, she, spent, she dies in 85. And she spent all her life really trying to, would you say exonerate Otto or at least maintain uh, memory? I mean, she, you, you literally couldn't have invent some of the things that she got up to. So, so one day, Horst says to me, can I give you all of my parents' papers? I say, yes. A, a tatty old USB stick pops through the, my letterbox a few days later. I open it. There's photographs, Nazi memorabilia, there's letters, diaries. But most unbelievably, there are 14 cassette tapes that have been digitized. Recordings that Charlotta made uh, in the 70s and in the early 80s, uh, as part of her exercise to, um, you know, recover her husband's reputation. And so I was able to listen to her track down Otto's old comrades, drink glasses, toast to the good old days. Uh, and it becomes very apparent from that period that she was uh, a true believer, shall we say, a Nazi true believer, right up to her dying day. But of course, in that material, I find extraordinary nuggets and we learn what a relationship of that kind was like. And I think that for me was the fascinating journey. Now, some members of the family did not want you to publish this book. And you said that Austria has not come to terms with the war the way Germany has. And I wondered why you thought this was the case. Well, it's a very complicated question we could spend. We could have a three hour seminar on the differences between Germany and Austria. But basically Germany uh, was treated from the beginning as a perpetrator state, whereas Austria, in 1955, signed a treaty with several countries, and Article 1 of that treaty described Austria as the first victim of Nazism. In fact, many of the top Nazis, like Wächter uh, and others, uh, were Austrians, and there were several Austrians in the famous trial at Nuremberg. And somehow, Austria has only come much later uh, to a reckoning. And one of the consequences of that is that a lot of people, powerful Nazis, were airbrushed out of history, and Otto was one of them. And indeed, it is right uh, that along comes this Brit uh, from London who suddenly has an interest in this story. And I think it's a bit of an understatement to say that many of the members of the family are less than thrilled uh, with the spotlight being placed on uh, the grandfather or the father, as the case may be. I think that's a bit of an understatement. Now, one of the great things about your book is it really does read like a thriller. And you open in the book in Rome where Otto died and died before he could be brought to justice. But then another mystery begins right there and the plot begins to thicken for you as a, a writer and investigator with what you call the five burials. And I wondered if we could go to your reading now from that chapter and then maybe sure. talk a little more. Sure. Just to give a context, Otto Wechter dies in Rome. He's been on the run for five years. He has become immersed in a, a sort of Cold War espionage ring. Uh, and he's buried on the 16th of July, 1949. Uh, in the Central Cemetery in Rome in Plot 38. 
Many decades later, I visited the sprawling monumental cemetery on a brutally hot summer's day with plenty of mosquitoes around. Charlotta would have seen his body for the last time in the cemetery. Section 38 is nearby, a few rows of faded headstones, but none bearing Otto's name. He was removed long ago. The circumstances emerged from another clipping in Charlotte's papers, a short article published in German newspaper in April 1961, which offered an arresting headline. Interpol searches for a body, the trail leads to Berlin. The article describes the efforts of Italian police and Interpol to locate the mortal remains of Freiherr Otto von Wechter, a Nazi era war criminal who was never brought to justice. According to the article, Otto's coffin was removed from the Campo Verano Cemetery in early 1960 at the request of his widow, Charlotte, so the remains could be transferred to a mausoleum in Palermo, Sicily. Approval was given by the Italian authorities. The coffin lifted out of the ground, loaded into a car and driven away. The destination was Sicily, but the remains never arrived. Horst explained to me what happened after Bishop Hudal reminded his mother of her husband's dying wish to be buried in Austria. Charlotte requested permission from the Italian authorities, but this was refused. So she applied to transport them to Palermo where her daughter Liesel lived. Charlotte drove to Rome, collected the body, but never took it south. Mother drove him to Austria, Charlotte Horst said to me with a large grin in her old dark green seaman's coat. The disappearance caused a scandal, a story circulated that he could still be alive. An Italian newspaper reported that Otto never actually died and that the body in section 38 was a fake. The idea that his father might have eloped and not stayed in contact with the family was for Horst unthinkable. When I revisited the possibility some time later, he asked me with moist eyes never again to say this in his presence. He knew what had happened. Mother brought the remains to the house in Salzburg. This was a reference to House Wartenberg at number two Riedenburgerstrasse, where Charlotte lived in the 1950s. This was where the family lived in a property christened in memory of the false name Otto used while on the run in 1934, and where Charlotte ran a German language school. The student lodgers were not aware that Otto's remains rested in the garden in a small box made of lead, Horst told me, near the watchful eye of a stone saint. He described its shape with his hands. I don't remember that I looked inside, but it must have contained my father's head, the skull, bones, arms, and Horst's voice trailed off. Thank you very much for that reading. So after Otto dies in Rome, that's, I mean, that's when your investigations really start spreading far and wide. You go to Los Angeles, you go to New Mexico. There are many conspiracy theories about how and why Otto died there in Rome. And I was really interested to read that one of your neighbours in London proved uh, very useful or interesting. Would you like to talk about how you had to consult John le Carre on this? I'd be happy to do that. I'm very fortunate in uh, having uh, David Cornwall, as he is known, but John Le Carre is his writer's name, as one of my neighbours uh, up the street. And for the last 20 years, one of my roles in life has been to check his manuscripts when there is a legal character or a legal issue. My role is to check that it's accurate. So I've got to know his writing very well. He's become a good friend. And when I discovered that Otto had stumbled into a spy network and myself not knowing anything about the Cold War or espionage, I thought I would go to him. Uh, he said, come over, bring a few photographs and letters, give me some background material, bring some cakes from the local bakery, which I did. Uh, we sat, uh, we talked, and the, he stunned me with the first thing he said. Uh, actually, Philippe, he said, this interests me. Uh, I was there in 1949, I was interrogating Germans. And I said, what, to prosecute them? He said, no, to recruit them. And that's what this story ends up being in part about. It's, it couldn't be invented. Spy recruiting, I know, fascinating. Uh, Horst maintains, uh, Otto's son, that his father was killed 
that it was a, a political revenge and he has all sorts of possible culprits. Um, do you f definitive, or I, actually, I don't want to ask you that because I want people to read the book. I want people to read the book and see <laughs> all the crazy avenues you spiral down um, after on your search for yeah. what happened and why. Um, a question has come in from a listener um, asking how important was synchronicity in the in your writing of these events? I wonder if they mean, I mean, in a way that you had many things happen in the course of writing that helped change direction of the book. I, I mean, I've written, it's essentially a double story that I've told. It's something that I've taken from an earlier book, East West Street, which some of the viewers, some of the people from the festival uh, may have read, where I sort of developed the technique and non-fiction technique of telling two stories in parallel, interweaving them. It's very complex. Um, and I'm, one of the things that I have to do is I have to grapple with this huge amount of material. Uh, and of course, there is a selection exercise that takes place. But, but one of the things I do in my writing, and it's drawn in part from uh, another writer who is one of my favorites, Stefan Spy, uh, who wrote many books. My personal favorite is a book called The World of Yesterday, is not to impose on the reader my own interpretations and my own emotions. I've come to appreciate that readers are highly intelligent and they form their own views and they interpret the material in their own ways. And so the style is essentially to unveil things more or less in the way I came across them so that the reader is working out from a very early stage that I'm leaving little clues. And one of the sources of great satisfaction for me is the correspondence I get from readers who interpret the clues in particular ways, sometimes in different ways from me. Horst, as you say, believes his father was poisoned either by the Jews or by the Soviets or by the Americans. Um, the alternative theory is that he caught a virus uh, and that he fell ill and died. One final thing to leave you with is Horst actually has a very close connection to New Zealand because in 1975, he and his wife sailed uh, the artist Hundred Wasser's boat uh, from Europe to New Zealand. And in fact, if your uh, viewers look very closely, they will see behind me the famous Hundred Wasser public toilets uh, from the Kawakawa, uh, which I'm very much hoping to come and visit next year. I really hope you can. And I think, that, I mean, it may seem bizarre to other people to say, I really hope you can come to New Zealand and visit our public toilets, but people who've been to the hundred <laughs> toilets know what you mean. Just one a question before, before we move on. Um, speaking of synchronicity, I see that in, uh, there's a character in the rat line, a Nazi who escapes to Syria and then to Chile and ends up working for uh, General Pinochet is going to be the subject of your next book. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you're, you've asked a smart question, you've raised it. Each, it's like a, a, a sort of baton race, East West Street, one minor character who emerged was Otto Wächter. Uh, and uh, in the rat line, one of the minor characters is called Walter Rauf. When uh, Otto Wächter arrives in Rome in the spring of 1949, he's parked in a Catholic monastery, the Vigna Pia Monastery, uh, by a friendly bishop, shall we say. And he occupies a monk's cell, which has recently been vacated by an old comrade, which I understood now means a former SS colleague, uh, who has escaped to Syria and who writes a letter to uh, Otto, which I have, saying, don't come to Syria, head for South America. And that's where Otto determines he will go. Uh, Ralph himself makes his way there. And as you described, he ends up in 1973, it is alleged, as an interrogator and torturer for the Pinochet regime, which of course becomes personal for me because 25 years later, I become involved in the Pinochet case in London. And one of Ralph's alleged victims signs an affidavit which lands on my desk. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. That's a sort of unexpected synchronicity, I suppose. Is it a coincidence or is it something else? How they are connected as private, I would say. Kia ora, thanks yeah. so much. Yeah. Philip, just uh, hang tight there and we'll come back to you towards the end of our session. Thank you very much, that was fantastic. Uh, so our next writer, staying in Germany in a way, though he's in Auckland, our next writer is Ian Weddy, or Ian Vedder, as perhaps I should call him. He is our own Renaissance man, a former poet laureate of New Zealand. He is also a respected novelist, essayist, and editor. For 10 years, he was head of art and visual culture at Te Papa. In his 2014 memoir, The Grass Catcher, Ian recounted a childhood and youth moving from Blenheim 
to East Pakistan, Bangladesh, an English boarding school and Jordan during the Civil War and explored the nature of memory. This discussion continues in his latest novel, The Reed Warbler. Kia ora, Ian. Kia ora. Now, Ian, memory and silence are at the heart of Philippe's book that we were just discussing and in your novel as well. Um, the Reed Warbler is an epic of a family moving from old world to new, both covering and uncovering the past. Did you always imagine it with this kind of scope or was it just a poem that got out of control? No, I think probably um, for once, you know, normally I, I would say you were quite uh, right to say it was a poem that got out of control and I would be happy to own that. Um, but in this case, it was a long time of piecemeal discovery, um, pondering a little bit about the origins, the German side of my family, um, remembering, you know, fragments of what my mother and father had told me, my mother in particular, um, and deciding in a way that that I had a kind of a duty to assemble, you know, this kind of fragmentary knowledge, but I couldn't do it. I didn't want to do it in the form of, um, if you like, a family history. It seemed the only way I could do it that was in any way legitimate and kind of true to the paucity of real knowledge that I had about my family uh, was to write a work of fiction. And so, um, you know, the main character uh, the Reed Warbler, Josefina, Josefina Riepen, no, that's my family name, uh, Josefina Hansen, um, is an invented character. Um, what happens to her, the dreadful things that happened to her, did not happen to my family members. And so the kind of real connections between Josefina and then the subsequent sprawling kind of cast of characters that both descend from and assemble around her are not in any way um, kind of truthful or direct representations or relations to my own family, my own German ancestry. Um, you know, the rest of my family ancestry is a good deal more mixed up than just the German part, um, but they do haunt it in a way. Um, and the haunting, if anything, comes about, as I think it does for many people, if you go to those places where you know factually that your family had some kind of, some kind of origin, you know, a location origin. Um, and you can go there in language, you can go there in literature, <clears throat> but you also, in my case, um, have the chance to go there um, geographically. So over the years, I have spent time in parts of Germany where my family were connected and in parts of New Zealand where they ended up, um, for example, in the remote Kaitieke Valley, where at one stage, three of my great uncles um, ended up, two, one remained, two walked off the land. Um, and so there are these kind of ghostly geographical and biographical connections, but it's a work of fiction. Largely, I would say it's a, a I'll, I'll throw a kind of self-effacing, you know, apology, apologia, uh, statistic over it and say, I think it's about 80% fiction. That's fair enough. I mean, can we just keep, keep talking about place actually, because in the 19th century sections of the novel, we are largely in, as you say, Northern Germany and Denmark, yeah. areas that have witnessed wars and shifting borders and tensions between different powers and cultures and languages, um, much as Poland and Ukraine and, and Philippe's work have well, with the, you know, even place names being changed. And as you say, your own great grandmother was part of that world. You visited Kiel and other places in Germany. You were the Creative New Zealand uh, writer in residence in Berlin for a while. And I wondered what, what shadows of your own past were you able to find in contemporary Germany or contemporary Wellington for that matter? Well, the very interesting thing about going up to Kiel was, um, I mean, I do have a remote cousin there, um, 
Detlef Riepen, who, marvelous guy, he's a, um, a journalist. But up there, um, knowing that my great grandmother, Maria uh, Riepen, uh, was from Kiel, but in fact departed from, uh, from Denmark. It's not clear why she was there at the time when she left to come to New Zealand. And at that time, um, the borders between what we now think of as uh, Northern Germany, uh, I mean, Germany as we know it didn't exist at that time. Um, it was a, a bunch of quite disparate little principalities with odd, you know, um, social and, and political connections and a very amorphous border really between Germany and Denmark, which is uh, to some extent preserved in, in Josephina's name, Josephina Hansen, um, which could have been a North German or a Danish name. And so um, going up to Kiel, I felt as though I was walking around within, I don't know, a kind of slightly ghostly haunted landscape. I was aware that my ancestral family had been there. I had a I had a sense of them having been there. I can't say I encountered them, you know, in a, in a kind of imaginative way while I was there, but I had a sense that this was where they had come from. This body of water and how it reached out to the Baltic, this was where they were. Um, this was a park that they may have walked across. Um, and there were little other vestiges that popped up, for example, um, there was a, a local poet, a really dreadful poet, um, with whom I tur it turned out my, my family had had some kind of strange connection. Um, and I found out about that in the archives in Berlin. Um, uh, there were these little, little hauntings, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But the main thing I think that it was possible to take away was simply a kind of a sense of uh, not just a geographical space, um, but a haunted, inhabited um, narrative space. Even though it was now, you know, a 20th century space, still there were those shapes of the land. There was that, um, there was that, you know, park, there were those trees, there were those winds. And being in that space allowed me, I think, in some degree to kind of inhabit a set of characters who, who, who could in some way represent a presence of an ancestral presence in some way, in some kind of haunted way. David Hill has just reviewed the novel for the spin-off and he praises the way he says your novel constantly steps between pasts and present in hundreds of small scenes, each lit as brightly as an opera stage. And I thought opera was an interesting comparison here because the novel has a dramatic premise that could appear in an opera, a young woman assaulted by a rich and more powerful man, rejected by her parents um, for bearing a child, forced into exile. But your Safina, your central character at the beginning of the book, doesn't languish and lament. What what does she do instead? Ah, um, well, she goes um, she goes to take refuge with her older sister in Denmark, in Huddersfield, um, and makes a succession of decisions, really revealing this. Uh, extraordinarily resolute character. Um, she will not give up her child. Um, she will not resile from what happened to her. Um, she will not accept the terms under which her parents want her to save them from the, the public shame of an illegitimate grandchild. Um, and so she departs. Um, and and in a way doesn't stumble into but makes decisions along the way that puts her into contact for example later with the um 
uh, with the second of the men in her interesting life, um, a radical journalist who did exist, um, um, who, who is a remote relative of ours, um, who was connected to Karl Marx and a kind of band of um, early um, left thinkers, um, politicians, philosophers, and a poet, um, also a really terrible poet, as it turns out, um, with whom she has a child. Um, and so it goes. So for me, the, um, the key to the pace of the narrative and the purpose of the narrative is her resoluteness, the way in which she doesn't just become a victim of circumstance, the way in which she turns these things that happen to her, some of which are awful and harmful and painful, but the way she turns them into um, a life that she then embraces and goes forward with, uh, not least the life of a remote farm in the Kaitiaki Valley in New Zealand. Ian, would you read from the book for us, please? Sure, sure. Um, uh, this, is a, this is the moment where we first meet Josefina. Just a couple of little pages. Um, just to put it in context, it, it starts somewhat after um, her encounter with the man who rapes her, by whom she has her child later. A little weak evening sunshine splashed across the flagstones. Josefina stopped mopping and listened. Yes, this time it was true. The birds had gone. She stepped outside and looked towards the town. The warblers weren't swirling around in crowds over the fjord. Their fussy little songs weren't coming from the reeds at the bottom of the slope by the river mouth. All she could hear was the whispering sound of wind in the dry stalks. The whispering sound had a swirling rhythm because of gusts blowing down the fjord towards the sea. The reed stalks had a rhythm too, a ripple that went along the shore and repeated itself over and over. In the pale blue sky above the fjord also, it was as though the streaky clouds moving away in the direction of the sea at Labo were making a whispering sound like the wind. They made the blue-green Nikolai Kircher steeple over the other side of the fjord seem to be toppling across the sky. A score of small coasters were anchored along the channel, along with two broad, larger vessels waiting for lighters. They were all pointing up into the wind, and the small ones were nodding a little together as the waves pushed their bows up and down. What would it feel like one day to turn with the wind and the tide and go easily down the fjord almost silently once the sails were set and had stopped snapping at the clouds beyond Labo. She wiped away the loose strand of hair that had blown across her cheek and with it the tears. The little Rosanga had gone. The twittery songs of their hundreds had stopped. They weren't there in the sky, swooping about in formations. They weren't in the reeds by the marsh. Their songs had gone away with them for the winter. They practice, her mother had told her. They come and go for a while. Then one day they don't return. And so you know that winter's coming, certainly. Where do they go? Somewhere nice and warm so the sailors say. But where? How should I know? Do oranges come from there? So they say. That was when she was a child. Now Muti was standing in the doorway 
narrowing her eyes against the late sunlight so that her expression said, but now you're not a child anymore. So have you finished, Mutti said. She had on the faded blue cotton cap she liked to wear when washing new linens. Her hair was all drawn back and her face looked pale and severe. Josefina could tell that her mother had seen she'd been crying. She still had the salty taste of the tears in the corners of her mouth. And perhaps their snail trails were still on her cheeks. But why should she hide them when they were true? Yes, finished, she said, and turned back to the view across the fjord. Finished what exactly? Mutti's silence was stiff, like the freshly washed linens that would freeze if you left them out too late in the coming months. Below the meadow, the evening train tooted three times as it slowly approached the mill station. Its smoke was blowing away in a long streamer in the same direction as the clouds. The station master would, be, would already be getting important and putting his official cap on. This he did three times a day. He had his whistle, of course, and his flag. Kia ora, Ian, that was a fantastic reading. Thank you. And thinking about your book, it's it's the God what's flying reverse in a way, the reed warbler. Um, we're we're going to come back to you a little bit later <laughs> when we join everyone together, but now we must move on. So kia ora, thank you very much. Kia ora. Our final guest today is Lisa Tadeo, joining us from Connecticut in the US. Lisa is a journalist, a fiction writer, and the author of the best-selling Three Women a work of non-fiction about female sexual experience and desire. Lisa spent almost a decade researching and writing the book, traveling around the US to conduct interviews. Three Women has been compared with Truman Capote's In Cold Blood in that it redefines its genre. Esquire called it a singular work of narrative non-fiction that reads like fiction. It's also a response or counterpoint to Gay Talisa's Thy Neighbor's Wife, an account of post-war sexuality in the US published in 1981. Kia ora, Lisa, thanks so much for joining us today. Kia ora, thanks for having me. Now, Lisa, I think In Cold Blood is an interesting point of comparison or useful in that Capote himself does not appear in it and you don't appear in Three Women. And this you're quite different in approach from Gay Talese. What informed this decision on your part? I, I wanted it to be very much the women's stories and not mine. I also did not want to have any sort of an opinion in their lives. I wanted it to be as though they were telling their stories and I wanted their voices to come through. I didn't want to levy an opinion or, or have my own voice in there in a way that I think would be distracting from what their stories were. Uh, your three central subjects in the book are Maggie, Lena, and Sloane, and two of them appear under pseudonyms to protect their identity. And I wondered if you could tell us a little about each and also tell us how you persuaded them to open up so incredibly to you. So um, Lena was the first woman that I began to speak to. I, she was a housewife in rural Indiana, and I found her when I moved to Indiana when I, at a certain point I was living in New York City and I just felt like New York City was both the epitome and the antithesis of the way that you know America would be viewed. So I moved to Indiana. I started a discussion group for women in the back room of a doctor's office. And I found Lena, she came into the room. She, the first thing she said was that her husband no longer wanted to kiss her on the mouth. That he had said that the sensation offended him. And I, I knew right away that, um, that I was, I was just transfixed by her, by not only her story, which was happening in real time, but by the absolute, just trenchant nature of what she was saying and feeling. And in terms of her opening up to me, it, it wasn't so much a persuasion or anything on my part. It was, she needed someone to listen and I had, and I needed, she, she needed someone to listen. I needed someone to talk to me. Um, and, uh, you know, her, it was just, she was, she came from a Catholic 
very strict family. Divorce was not an option and she had nobody to listen to her. So that was Lena. Um, Maggie is a young woman who I was, I was um, driving through North Dakota. I was reading a story in the local newspaper about a young woman whose trial had just ended. She had uh, brought charges against her high school English teacher who she uh, alleged that he had um, he, they had had sexual relations when she was underage and he was her teacher. And um, the, there were, you know, hundreds of hours of phone calls past 11 p.m. and midnight. And, you know, my mother once said to me that nothing good happens after midnight. And so when I, when I saw that, I saw that there were these hours of phone calls, I couldn't imagine anybody not believing this young woman. And yet the jury did not believe her. And I just, you know, I wanted to tell her story from her point of view because nobody had had told it. And so I drove to her house. I, I called her mother and, you know, I found their number in the white pages and I drove to see them. And I told Mich I told um, Maggie that, you know, I, I just said, I don't know what I'm writing about. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I do know that I believe you. And I think that the world, if they read it, if the rest of the country reads it and not just a small town in North Dakota, that they would see it the way that I did. So that was Maggie. Uh, and finally, Sloan. I um, met Sloan after moving into uh, her town in Newport, Rhode Island. And I was talking to several people looking for a new subject. And uh, someone that I met said, oh, you're writing a book about sex. Uh, there's this woman named Sloan. And not only uh, she's, you know, her husband likes to watch her have sex with other women, but even, you know, and she delivered this next part, like it was even more shocking. She said that not only, not only is she a swinger, but her husband wants to have sex with her every day. And not only does she allow it, but she also wants it. So that was shocking. Um, and in terms of her opening up to me, it was much the same as Lena and Maggie, in a sense. I wasn't persuading anyone to do it. I was kind of just, you know, I also didn't know what I was doing. And I said, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to write some things and if you know you can read it before I publish it and if you don't like anything we can take it out or you can take it yourself out completely. That person who said to you you're writing a book about sex is that how you saw it yourself when you were doing it? Uh, you know the book like you said was um, was a kind of uh, meant to be a not necessarily a counterpoint although I think that's what it became it was a sort of um, a, a something in the vein of like like thy neighbor's wife and uh, as such you know that was a book about sex mine I, I think became more a book about desire and while you know I spent a couple of I spent at least a year just focusing on sex I went to a place called the porn castle in San Francisco where there were just multiple rooms where you know women mostly were having sex on camera and or they were having sex you know against a computer and people were paying by the 15 minute right so I did a lot of things where I just looked at sex and ultimately that those sorts of those those things would have been fine for a chapter or an article in a magazine, but at book length, they just did not, I didn't feel like they, that they would touch anyone or me. In each of the cases of, of, of the women, and, and each story is, is fascinating and complex, but in each, it seems to me they suffered from the judgments of other women. Yes. And that was one of the things that I, I noticed began to, to link them together was that they were all judged completely by their communities. And I started to see that it almost became more, almost in some cases, more of the story than their own stories. The fact that, you know, it was, it was written um, and, and researched, you know, about 97% before the Me Too movement happened. But, um, you know, even, even now with Me Too, I think that women are still judging other women to at, at a rate that is shocking to me. And even though, we are finally saying what we don't want, you know, with men, et cetera. I think that it's it, the inverse problem is that we are getting ever more uh, afraid of telling other women what we do want because we're not allowed to want the wrong, the wrong thing. We see Lena and her women's group um, telling the story of her marriage and of uh, reconnecting with someone she really liked at high school before something very traumatic happened to her. 
and they are both fascinated but also very unsupportive would you say the that lena was on support so uh, lena's uh, woman for, w the woman who lena's oh, yes. yes um they were you know at first i think that and this happens often i think it happens with doesn't matter whether it's a woman or a man uh, when someone is crying and feeling sad and lonely and unwanted, I think other people sort of, you know, it feels good to help someone and to come to their rescue. But when all of a sudden that same person comes back into the room and is like shining and, and glowing and so excited that they just had the best sex of their lives. And perhaps these other women, I know because I've sp spoken to them, they're having, they're sort of in, you know, relationships with, boyfriends who aren't quite paying attention to them or husbands who have stopped, you know, um, wanting them in a certain way. And to have this woman come in who sort of just is, is just the epitome of this, like, you know, going back in time to high school and to, to just, um, it, it's difficult for people to process that and not be jealous. And, and so that's what I saw from the women. They told me after Lena left the room or in private that they thought she was a whore. The, the way you open the book is with something intensely personal, which is the story of your mother. And I believe you'd like to read some of that prologue to us today. Mm -hmm. Would you like to set it up at all for the, for the listeners? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I, I didn't, didn't start researching the book thinking that I was going to include anything about motherhood in it. And um, I also, I had thought a lot about my own mother who had passed away recently when I started the book but I didn't, didn't really connect it to desire. And what I found as I was talking to these women and indeed so many women, hundreds across the country was that the sort of weight of the desire um, of their mothers, whether we knew too much or too little or even just the perfect amount was so, uh, so much a weight on, on the way that we see our own selves, the way that we believe we should be treated by lovers um, and et cetera. So, I, while, you know, while I did, wanted to stay very much out of the book, my voice, et cetera, I needed to do, sort of bookend it with something. And I chose using my mother because I felt like it was sort of a link between, between those three women and every woman that I spoke to. So this is uh, the beginning of the prologue. When my mother was a young woman, a man used to follow her to work every morning and masturbate in step behind her. My mother had only a fifth grade education and a dowry of medium grade linen dish towels, but she was beautiful. It's still the first way I think of to describe her. Her hair was the color of the chocolates you get in the Tyrolean Alps, and she always wore it the same way, short curls piled high. Her skin was not olive like her family's, but something all its own, the light rose of inexpensive gold. Her eyes were sarcastic, flirtatious, brown. She worked as the main cashier at a fruit and vegetable stand in the center of Bologna. This was on the Via San Felice, a long thoroughfare in the fashion district. There were many shoe stores, goldsmiths, perfumeries, tobacconists, and clothing stores for women who did not work. But before she came into this commercial zone, she would have a quiet walk from her apartment down little carless streets and alleys, past the locksmith and the goat butcher, through lonely porticos filled with the high scent of urine, and the dark scent of old water pooling in stone. It was through these streets that the man followed her. Where had he first seen her? I imagine it was the fruit stand, this beautiful woman surrounded by a cornucopia of fresh produce, plump figs, hills of horse chestnuts, sunny peaches, bright white heads of fennel. He was in his 60s, large nose and balding, with a white pepper growth across his sunken cheeks. He wore a newsboy cap, like all the other old men who walked the streets with their canes on their daily caminata. One day he must have followed her home because on a clear morning in May, my mother walked out the heavy door of her apartment and there was this old man she had never seen waiting for her. He smiled and she smiled back. Then she began her walk to work, carrying an inexpensive handbag and wearing a calf length skirt. Her legs, even in her old age, were absurdly feminine. I can imagine being inside this man's head and seeing my mother's legs and following them. One inheritance of living under the male gaze for centuries is that heterosexual women often look at other women the way a man would. She could sense his presence behind her for many blocks, 
past the olive cellar and the purveyor of ports and sherries, but he didn't merely follow. At a certain corner, when she turned, she caught a movement at the side of her eye. The stone streets were naked at that hour in the toothache of dawn, and she turned to see he had his penis, long, thin, and erect, out of his pants, and he was rapidly exercising it up and down with his eyes on her in such a steady manner that it seemed possible that what was happening below his waist was managed by an entirely different brain. She was frightened then, but years after the fact, the fear of that first morning was bleached into sardonic amusement. For the months that followed, he would appear outside her apartment several mornings a week, and eventually he began to accompany her from the stand back to her home as well. At the height of their relationship, he was coming twice a day behind her. My mother is dead now, so I can't ask her why she allowed it day after day. I asked my older brother instead why she didn't do something. It was Italy, the 1960s. The police officers would have said, ma lo perdere è un povero vecchio, è una meraviglia che il cazzo duro a sua età. Leave it alone, he's a poor old man. It's a miracle he can get it up at his age. My mother let this man masturbate to her body, her face, on her walk to work and on her walk back. She was not the type of woman to take pleasure in this, but I can't know for sure. My mother never spoke about what she wanted, about what turned her on or off. Sometimes it seemed that she didn't have any desires of her own. Thanks very much, Lisa. It's, I'm listening to all of you speak today. I'm realizing that though we didn't intend it, given this is Mother's Day in New Zealand and the US, we do have a certain theme emerging around mothers and that all of you in the, all the books you've written, um, The Ratline, uh, The Reed Warbler and your book, Three Women, that, that mothering and mothers are very important. What they teach, what they withhold, the models uh, or the forces they are in our lives for better or worse. Um, was that something you were very aware of while you were writing the book or when you were interviewing the women and writing their stories? It, it, it came sort of, um, it, it happened in, in stages it, it sort of it wasn't until the last two months of writing the book that I decided to write about my own mother and would you have written your book three women if your mother was still alive <laughs> you know what's funny is um my editor when he first you know told me about his idea he was his idea for me to write a book period which was very shocking because I didn't I had never written a book um he said you know I feel like this will be really good for you because both your parents are dead so you won't have anyone um you know to be afraid of reading it you know I don't know I don't know to be honest I just don't know let's bring back Philippe and Ian if, if we may to join the conversation because I wanted to ask each of you a particular question um it was based on something Ian said once he described uh, Ian you described your poetry as political because you said your poems were, we, we were concerned with how we live and how we should live, which made them political. And I wondered how you all thought about your books in terms of them being political. For, Philippe, what do you think about yours? Well, I mean, I would say that every human act is political and uh, whether it intended or unintended, uh, it has political consequences. Um, is the rap line political? Is East West Street political? I mean, it depends, obviously, what you mean by political, but certainly I had an agenda. Um, I had a multiplicity of agendas. I mean, I listened both to Ian and Lisa, and I'm sure they were informed by a whole range of instincts. I wanted, I suppose, to tell the story of Otto Wechter in the rap line, because it was a way of bringing him out of obscurity, a way of helping people to understand what he had done but I think even more so, it was a way of putting the spotlight on Charlotta because it's the great untold story of what the spouses and the lovers and the partners and the significant others were involved in. I mean, these guys would go out and do a day's horrendous activity and then come home and party and go to the opera and go to Salzburg and various other things. And they did so in a home environment and I was fascinated. So I suppose the politics of the book, in a sense, is the focus on a couple and understanding how they worked together. But in another way, the politics of the book is a sort of homage to my grandfather, because I grew up in a world in which he never talked to me about this period. And I wanted to find out about him. And in finding out about him, I suppose, find out about myself. So if people think that's political, then yes, it's, it's political. 
Thank you. And, and I should say to people as well that your book is kind of the anti-sound of music. It's sort of the antidote to those <laughs> of us who have romantic ideas about Austria during the war. Ian, your book is explicitly political in some ways in that your character, Wolf Bloch, as you said, um, is a social democrat, uh, driven out of Germany by Bismarck uh, in correspondence with Friedrich Engels. But do you see it as political in, in other and more personal ways as well? Oh, I think absolutely. I mean, um, I mean, you know, one way or another, we all live within uh, a set of political circumstances. Um, which we are responsible for or participate in in various ways. But, you know, whether we're passive occupiers or whether we're engaged, um, in a sense, it doesn't matter. The circumstances in which we live are inevitably political. And I think for me, um, I mean, writing has always, whatever I'm writing has always involved um, trying to remain alert to those circumstances um, and whether or not that means that I engage as a writer in an explicit way or not, I'm still trying to remain um, aware, let's say, um, receptive. Um, certainly in this novel, its historical uh, background, you know, the age of uh, the rise of Bismarck and so on, um, is intensely political and in fact the character that you mention was based on an ancestor of mine a rather distant one who did correspond with Friedrich Engels um, and who left um, a rather odd legacy of dreadful poetry but actually very interesting political writing um, and you know the way those hauntings occur inside the book are not only the result of a family history, but I think also the result of my sense that people um, and their stories and the family relationships, you know, even at the micro level um, are in some way or another um, connected to the larger political world, shaped by it, influenced by it, responding to it. So. Um, for me, the Reed Warbler, you know, it has a it has a basic political template in its history, but I think it has a much more intimate, personal one in the way those stories are, to some extent, um, uh, articulated by the the larger political history. And each of you also, I mean, has a female character, and in your case, Philippa, a real woman very much defined or, or their lives are changed by their sexual relationships. Lisa, in your work talking to your three women, I mean, I, I was struck all the way throughout reading that that if various turns were taking them down often very dark paths. I think about Lena and what happened to her at high school and in fact Maggie and what happened to her at high school. That, that sexual <coughs> relationships is something that um, can be their downfall as well as their as well as something that makes them happy. Was it when you were writing the book? Did you have any notion going in that it would be often that dark and that complex? I I, did, I wasn't sure, but um, what I felt from the very beginning, what I noticed from the very beginning, is that when people, you know, if if someone sort of um, at a sort of comfortable position in their lives, perhaps they're you know, picking out paint color or, you know, deciding whether or not to take a vacation, that people are in those places are probably not going to talk to someone about their lives. And then I'm probably not going to want to listen. So for me, it was, um, it was about the sort of the idea of passion and pain meeting was so interesting to me. I also think that when you are in the throes of a high passion, you're also probably inevitably about to be in the throes of a pain or something similar. Uh, it's just the way it usually works. And one of the things I realized by talking to them was, you know, there are people who said that the women were victims, which I thought was beyond being untrue, perhaps not with Maggie, but I think calling someone a victim is the most victimizing thing that you can do. But what I noticed about the, um, the sort of passion and the pain is that we are all 
can be either the heroes or the victims of our own narratives uh, throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month. And so for me, yes, I think that the passion and the pain are inextricable. I think we all have those moments. And I think that when we're done having those moments, we forget what it felt like and we it's able, we're able to look down on the people who are in the middle of that. Thank you very much. I, I feel very sad to tell you it is now 10 o'clock and we should really be wrapping up because this is so interesting. I could happily talk to the three of you for another hour, um, especially now that we've had our Mother's Day theme inadvertently. <laughs> is there anything else any of you would like to say before I wrap up and, and we throw you back to your everyday lives? <laughs> Sleep. Do you have a message um, for us? No, I mean, I just think you've curated this so beautifully, just listening to Ian and Lisa. The points of connection are very, are very profound. And uh, particularly, I have to say, um, Lisa's work is very closely connected. I mean, going through the diaries of Otto and Charlotta, uh, you, Paul, you, you've read the book, so you, you, you are aware. I came across a lot of very intimate stuff. I mean, in 1934, Otto flees Vienna turns up in Berlin, waits for the family to arrive. Charlotte arrives two years later with two young children in tow and discovers her husband is having an affair with a young woman called Tauta. Uh, and Charlotte doesn't leave it at that. She gets rid of the woman. Uh, and then two years later, a year and a half later, when she becomes pregnant and delivers a child, their first daughter, what does she do to get her own back? She names the daughter Tauta. Uh, and as you can imagine, the relationship between mother and daughter would have been defined by that act. So sex and the politics of sex is absolutely central as it is in all of our lives, but the lives of the Nazis were very dominated by the theme that you yeah. and, and, and Ian and, and Lisa have, have evoked, absolutely. Thank you. Ian, any final words for us? Well, yes, I'm, I've been fascinated to hear and very much enjoyed hearing um, I, I kind of refrain in, in what my fellow panellists have been saying, which is the extraordinary alchemy of that, that kind of ambiguous plane where what we think of as research, the documentary, um, you know, the responsible record, and what we think of as fiction, um, that wonderful alchemical place. And I heard it referred to um, with great uh, eloquence in, in both my fellow panelists' work. Um, and I just think for me, it's, it's such a transforming place to go in and for me to go in as a reader um, to discover ways of understanding the world, which are not simply dogmatically factual, but involve uh, an imaginative kind of engagement or understanding or sympathy. Um, and so it was great. I had a wonderful morning. Thank you. Kia ora, Ian. And Lisa, quite properly, you will have the last word on this. <laughs> I, I mean, I just enjoyed listening to Philippe and Ian so much, um, both topics and, and books that I'm, you know, just fascinated by, and I'm going to pick them up. I have not read them yet, um, but now I just, I, you know, and I'm sure thousands of people out there are going to do the same thing. Uh, it was just lovely. I wish that this had been in person. And um, yeah, I just, i very grateful for this. And I can't wait to one day visit New Zealand. We really hope to, to welcome you here uh, very soon. And I should say, I can claim no credit for this program. This is the uh, the genius of the Auckland Writers' Festival and inviting you all to the festival this year and putting this program together. I'd like to thank everyone who has made this episode possible today. Um, our, our writers, our audience, Nicholas Stoolbridge and Tessa Yeoman from the Auckland Writers' Festival team and Francis von Kalk, Van Kalk sorry, from Auckland Live. Um, kia ora in particular to our generous sponsors and partners who are listed on the festival's website Thank you for your ongoing support, especially with this new initiative in what's been an unprecedented time for all of us. Now, this episode can be viewed again at your leisure on the festival website. And remember, the 2020 Auckland Writers Festival program is still your best reading guide for the year. And if you'd like a hard copy, drop them a line via their website and they'll send one out to you. Um, 
Tune in again next week at this early hour when our guests will include Chanel Miller, author of the critically acclaimed memoir, Know My Name, and the renowned British travel and environmental writer, Robert McFarlane, discussing his latest book, Underland. Uh, kia ora to Lisa, to Philippe, to Ian. See you all at the same time, same place next week. Matawa.